testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But the scripture tells us that they found none. Their philosophy was right, not innocent until proven guilty, but guilty before proven innocent. They had an agenda. We could, we could think back and look back, and, and we do look back, and we realize it was, a, as they say, a kangaroo court, right? It was a joke. The, the scriptures tell us that they struggled to make their case against Jesus Christ, the, the case that would allow them to put him before Rome and say, this man must die, this man must be crucified. They struggled. The scripture tells us that many false witnesses came forward, but they couldn't find any that agreed. And I thought, you know, sometimes justice is, is inconvenient, isn't it? If you want to do something justly, it's oftentimes inconvenient. And they were finding justice inconvenient. But at last, the word of God tells us that there, there came forward two false witnesses that at least partially agreed with each other. They said that Jesus said, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another. And of course, as they made this charge, what they were really uh, saying about Jesus as they twisted his words, which we'll look at his actual words here in just a minute, but that what they were really saying about Jesus was that Jesus somehow was calling for the temple's destruction, and that somehow... Uh, Jesus' act, uh, they were accusing him of being sacrilegious and, and having designs to destroy the very temple of God. And in this sacrilegious action that Jesus was calling for, they were really uh, accusing Jesus of sedition, right? Because he would uh, be attacking not only the, religious, uh, the religion of the Jews and, and committing sacrilege in destroying the temple, but also it was an act of sedition because it was a, it was a, uh, a threat to the, Rome, uh, to the Roman authorities who were ultimately in charge at that time. And so they were accusing Jesus of sacrilege and sedition. And of course, these two false witnesses that they found that at least partially agreed with one another, they were actually twisting and misinterpreting what Jesus did say because Jesus said sim something similar to this. And we know that in life... Oftentimes something is said and a little bit of twist is put onto it and pretty soon just it has a completely different meaning. We see that all the time, right? We see that all the time in the news and TV and, and even in our own lives. And so they had heard something. Uh, maybe they heard it themselves or somebody repeat it. But this is what Jesus actually said. Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. That's what Jesus said. But he didn't, in this statement that Jesus said, he didn't refer to anything about calling for the destruction of the physical temple. Or he didn't say, I'm going to destroy it. But he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the good news is that we're not left to wonder what Jesus meant. That he wasn't referring to the physical temple, right? But he was referring to the temple of his body. He was, he was making a prophetic a proclamation, if you will. He was saying that if he is killed, he will be raised again from the dead three days later. That's what he was saying. If you destroy this temple, I will raise it up. But again, this was a kangaroo court and they weren't really interested in the truth. They were only interested in the evidence that would lead uh, to the conviction of Jesus Christ that somehow he was a blasphemer, that somehow he was a seditionist, that somehow he needed to die, that he was a threat. And they wanted to present the case before Pilate, before Rome. Their objective was simple, these religious leaders that we so-called, so present a picture that Jesus Christ is a blasphemer and make Rome do the dirty work. Right? Because it makes sense. No sacrilegious, blasphemous person who incites sedition or violence uh, should live, right? That would be their argument. And, of course, one of the things that they said as Pilate waffled a little bit is, you're no friend to Caesar if you let this man live. You know, the scriptures tell us that these, these charges that were trumped up, Jesus refused to answer them. 
And I can understand that, you know, you don't, sometimes you just don't want to answer a charge because you don't want to dignify it, this ridiculous charge. And besides the fact that Jesus knew that he had come to die, right? He knew his mission. He knew what he was there, that he knew what he became incarnate for 30 some years before, 33 some years before. He knew he wasn't there to argue out of the situation, right? He was going as a lamb to the slaughter, as the scripture says. He was going willingly, and he knew that. So he wasn't there to argue anyways, but I think somehow in his silence, he was, he was not dignifying this ridiculous accusation. But the religious authorities, they weren't finished. And I think that they must have somehow felt that they needed a little stronger case. A little, uh, a little more gas in the tank, if you will. They weren't finished. And so we read in Matthew 26 this, this. 26, 62, I apologize. 62 won't be in front of you. I'm going to read that. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath. By the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Remember, they were looking to convict Jesus of blasphemy, of defaming God. And in this case, they were trying to get Jesus to compare God with something that they perceived as so unworthy of comparison, Jesus himself as they saw it. And so their question, it was a loaded question, right? This would certainly seal the deal. So they asked him that they might hear it out of his own mouth. Are you the son of God? Do you dare make yourself or claim to be divine? Do you dare claim to be equal with God? Jesus was compelled to answer this question. And here's his responses as recorded in the Gospels. I am. It is as you said. You rightly say that I am. And if that wasn't enough, Jesus added a little more to it. He said, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. You know what the reaction of the high priest was at that point? He tore his clothes. He couldn't believe it that this mere mortal would claim to be the Son of God, to claim to be divine, to claim to be equal with God, and to claim that he himself would sit at the very right hand of God and come in the great power of the glorious heavens, the clouds. And the high priest, he couldn't hardly believe his ears. But I think he must have been happy when he heard it because he he knew this is what I wanted to hear. This is good. And so he says in Matthew 26, 65, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ. Who is the one who struck you? And they crucified him. History records this conflict, this trial of the ages, if you will, that happened 2,000 years ago. History records the religious leaders of the day bringing these charges before Jesus the Christ, the Nazarene. But let me just say this, that it is Jesus who is the one who has been vindicated ever since. They killed him, 
But for the past 2,000 years, Jesus Christ has been vindicated that his testimony was correct, that he was right in his saying that he was the Son of God, that he would sit at the right hand of God. It is him, it is he who has been proven right. It is him who has been cleared of all charges. Here's four ways that Jesus, the Nazarene, has been vindicated. Number one, he was vindicated by his father through his resurrection from the dead. Amen. Amen. His own father vindicated him, raising him from the dead. Death couldn't hold him, right? We read in Romans 1, 4, 1, 3, and 4, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection from the dead identified who Jesus Christ was. Yes, he was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, but he was the Son of God, declared that through the resurrection. Didn't make him the Son of God, but it declared that he was the Son of God. It identified him as that because the grave couldn't hold him. History tells us that the tomb was empty, right? The tomb was empty, and it's still empty today. They never found his body because he had, he had risen. He's alive, right? They never found it. The tomb was empty. History tells us that they sealed his tomb so that if it was tampered with, people would know. And history tells us that they set a guard to secure it so no disciples could come and steal the body of Jesus because they were worried. You read the accounts, right? They were worried that they would come and do this. And I think to myself, why would the disciples want to steal the dead body of Jesus? It doesn't make any sense. that If, if Jesus was dead, everything that Jesus had taught, everything that Jesus had ta- said wouldn't mean anything to him, right? If he was going to be dead, so why would they steal his body? The, the history tells us that, that besides all that, they were gripped with fear. They were in hiding. Did they not all forsake him and flee the night when he was arrested before his crucifixion? They all ran off, right? And the one guy who, who stood behind, Peter, he denied him three times, right? History tells us that the risen Lord, his tomb was empty. They set a guard, but that didn't stop him from rising from the dead. And history tells us that the Lord showed himself openly, right, after his resurrection. That he presented himself alive, Acts 1-3 tells us, after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them for 40 days. The scriptures tell us that he appeared to his disciples, that he appeared to Thomas, right? The the one that missed Jesus the first time and wanted to touch his hands and touch his side. That he appeared to the disciples, that he appeared to Thomas, that he appeared to his half-brother James, that he appeared to 500 at at one time, and finally to Saul or Paul. He appeared to all of these people, showing himself alive. And I like the one way one commentator put it, that it's worthy of note that on most of these occasions, our Lord afforded his disciples the amplest opportunity of testing the fact of his resurrection. He conversed with them face to face, right? He ate with them. They touched him. And he ate bread with them. And so in this courtroom of the ages, 2,000 years ago, where these two false witnesses were brought forward to condemn Jesus resulting in his death, know this, that his father has vindicated him, that he has shown him to be right, that he has shown him to be his son. Romans 1, 4 again tells us that his resurrection was in fact an identifier or a declaration that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. The grave couldn't hold him because of who he was. Amen? The grave couldn't hold him because of who he was. 
Number two, he was vindicated by his disciples through their lives lived and sacrificed to him. The very lives of the disciples testify to the risen Lord. Consider the, the impact that Jesus' death had on the disciples. They were broken men, right? They were men that lived in fear. They were men that lived in despair. Remember the, the, one of the guys on the road to Emmaus? He said, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. At Christ's crucifixion, not remembering, not considering that Jesus Christ was going to be raised from the dead three days later, they were broken men. They were men who lived in fear as they forsook him and fled. But history tells us of their changed lives. Amen? Of their transformation. That in their lives we see something incredible happen. We see boldness, right? In the place of fear. We see sacrifice. We see, we could call it like this, economic abandon, right? When you sell everything and put it in a common pool and say, I'm all in, I call that economic abandon. That's what they did. These were changed men. These were transformed men. These were men to whom the risen Lord showed himself openly with many infallible proofs conversing with them face to face, eating with them, right? Saying, touch my scars, see. These men who were so broken now were turning the world upside down, amen? They were turning the world upside down from fear and rejection and denial to hope and power and boldness. We could speak of Peter who on the day of Pentecost stood up, right, boldly, Boldly, you know, Peter didn't know there was going to be 3,000 conversions, right? There were 120 in that upper room as the Holy Spirit was poured out, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy and declare the glorious works of God. Peter didn't know what was going to unfold. Somehow the religious leaders didn't disappear during that time, right? They were still there, but Peter, in the power of the Holy Spirit, stood up because he had seen the risen Lord. He knew whom Jesus was. The, the gospel, the message of the kingdom of God was beginning to be unpacked in the mind of Peter and he stood up in the power of the Holy Spirit. It was Peter who, under severe threatening by these same religious leaders to not speak in Jesus' name, said this, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. This is the same guy. This is the same Peter. His life is different. His life is transformed. It was this Peter who rejoiced when he was beaten. Amazing. To be beaten and then to rejoice? That was Peter. This is what he said, that they rejoiced, counting it worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ. This was a changed group of disciples. This was a changed group of lives. It was nothing short of vindication. Their lives lived in recognition of Jesus Christ, in boldness and in power, in a new life, was nothing short of a vindication of what Jesus said in that courtroom, in that trial. They followed Jesus. They lived for him. They suffered for him. They died for him. Their lives testified that this Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth was and is the Son of God. Number three, he was vindicated by the early church through their exaltation, through their worship, through their proclamation of his life, his death, burial, and resurrection. Just take what happened with the lives of the disciples and uh, expand it exponentially, and then you'll have a picture of the New Testament church. It was the New Testament church that exalted, right, that lifted up, that worshipped Jesus, the Son of God. Their worship, of course, was a proclamation that Jesus was divine, right? They were no idolaters, right? They wouldn't worship that who was not God, but they worshipped Jesus Christ, they understood what being the Son of God was all about, that it meant that he was equal with the Father and one with him in the Godhead. 
they believed Jesus Christ and proclaimed him as the only begotten son of God. They vindicated him with their lives lived for him and their worship of him. Jesus as the son of God and his resurrection were the unifying theme and foundation for the New Testament church. Think about that, that, that what bound them together, what unified them, what made them one was their faith in the risen Lord and in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. It was their common belief, their common hope, their common source uh, for a impassioned and an ardent devotion to the Lord Jesus. And not only did it bind them together, but also his deity and his resurrection unified them, gave them a unifying message to the world, right? It served as the foundation of the message that the early church proclaimed. It wasn't just that it bound them together, but his resurrection and his deity was what they proclaimed to the world. Isn't it true that all the Gospels end with Jesus Christ as risen and the exalted Lord of heaven? That was their message. That was what bound them together. And as we look at the witness of the New Testament church, we realize that they vindicated Jesus Christ. They proved he was right through their lives and their worship of him. And number four, finally, today he is vindicated by transformed lives, right? Amen? We sang it. We serve a risen Savior. I know he's in the world today, and because he lives in me, right? I'm not getting the verse right, but we remember that verse. Because I know he lives because he lives in me. You see, the risen Christ, the resurrection, uh, the power that brought Jesus Christ back from the dead is not just isolated to Jesus Christ, but God tells us that power dwells in us through his Spirit, and the Holy Spirit empowers us to live transformed lives. And so when we're, when we're changed, right, within the, the inner man, when we're empowered and encouraged and walk in faith and walk in victory over that which uh, our flesh would do, we're testifying to the risen Lord. We're saying the Lord Jesus lives because the same power that raised him from the dead dwells in me and I walk in newness of life. Transformed lives declare that he's alive. And countless people today share in that testimony that he lives, that I know that he's the only begotten son because in Jesus' name, I've received the Holy Spirit. And so the question I want to close with today is, is your life vindicating the Lord Jesus Christ? Is his power, the power of his resurrection and his person, who he is, is it playing out in your life? Are you changed? Is your life marked by boldness, by sacrifice, by economic abandon, by suffering for the cause for him? Is your life marked by hope and power and declaration of who he is? And really, we, we answer the question, well, it depends, right? How are you living? How are you living? And let me ask this question, are you on the right side of history, right? Right? Are you on the right side of history? Where would you land in that courtroom? How would you answer the charges that were laid at Jesus' feet? Are you on the right side of that courtroom verdict 2,000 years ago? And let me just say that it's not just that we have all the evidence in the past of the, the Lord Jesus Christ living, but that the evidence is growing. There's mounting evidence for the resurrection of Christ because people are still being saved. People are still being set free. Chains are being broken. Burdens are being lifted, right? The spiritually blind and desolate and hopeless are being filled with hope. The evidence is mounting. What side are you on, right? Was Jesus' testimony there before the Sanhedrin, the highest religious authority of the land. Was it a fantasy? Was it fiction? Was it truth? You answer with your life and by your life. And let me just say in closing, worship team, would you come? Christ 
has been vindicated, he is vindicated, and he will be vindicated. And so may we all be on the right side of history. May we all be on the right side of that verdict 2,000 years ago. Let's, let's stand. Lord Jesus, you gave a good testimony, Lord, as the scriptures tells us that day, as you stood. Lord Jesus, you testified to the truth of who you were. You knew that it would be that it would be proven. And Lord, you went through all that, all that suffering and the shame and the humility, the humiliation. Lord, that we might live. Father, that we might live in you. God, today we praise you and we worship and we stand in awe of the work that you have accomplished in the person of your son, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for raising him from the dead, that it was not possible that the grave would hold him. And we thank you, Father, that today the the reality of his resurrection is at work in us in our hearts through the power of your spirit that all the junk that the adversary would throw our way pales in comparison to the power that is at work in us the power of new life of life from the dead we worship and we thank you today and Lord as we break bread together Lord we just pray that you would bless the food to the nourishment and strength of our bodies we thank you for it In Jesus' mighty name, amen.